Let's dive into the BHS. What is the BHS? It's Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. All right, that's a mouthful. It's German. It's the Hebrew Bible. It's published by the, the American Bible Society. And as of today, it's the current edition of academic Hebrew studies when it comes to studying the Hebrew Bible. Now it's based on the Leningrad Codex, an 11th century AD manuscript of the Hebrew Bible. It features the Masoretic notes, the vowel pointings, the accent pointings, the marginal notes, okay? So we're gonna go over about all, all of that so you know what you're looking at when you open the pages of the BHS. This is gonna be important so that when we get to Ruth and start translating, you know what you're looking at. Now, at the beginning of the BHS is the prefaces, and there's a bunch of good information here. You should check out the forward in the fifth edition. It's in numerous languages. Find it in your language. In this case, I'm assuming English. You should read it. It gives you really good, helpful information about the text, its features, and so on. There's also a forward to the first edition. You should read that as well because these forwards build on each other, right? The features build on each other. And you're going to get a lot of really helpful information about what you're seeing in the Masora Parva, for example, uh, with these forwards. So you, you need to check the prefaces. Make sure you read these and understand what it's saying is there with the features of the BHS text. Now keep in mind, the original Hebrew text did not have vowel pointings, nor did it have accent marks. That was added later by the Masoretes. These were the group of scribes that labored over the text and preserved the oral traditions that they had up until that time by creating these pointing systems. This is why, for example, we have unchangeable long vowels because these are vowels that are based on a consonant and therefore are always in the text. They're always in the word. They're always in the written word. Whereas other vowels can change. Why? Because they go below the consonants or above the consonants and they can change due to defective spelling. So all of this is to say that the Masoretes are kind of responsible for what we have in the vowel pointings. Now, how do you navigate the BHS? First of all, you have the title up top. Uh, what's cool is on the left side, you'll have the English title on the right side, you'll have the Hebrew title. Now by left side, I mean the left page and the right side, I mean the right page, or if it's a single page, uh, and it's the initial page of that, of that book, you, you should have the English along with the Hebrew. Now you can see the Hebrew text. It includes all the consonants. It includes the vowel pointings. It includes the accents. It also includes textual variants. More on that later. You can tell the major textual variants by the brackets. So whenever something's in brackets, it's a major textual variant. You can see in the margins, the Masora Parva. These are kind of like, in essence, the cliff notes, the special notes from the Masoretes. They've even done things like they've calculated the exact middle of a passage and they've annotated it in the margins. Very clever. Sometimes in the Masora Parva, you'll get uh, corrections. So if the Masoretes know that the oral tradition got something wrong, they'll put the correction in the margins and leave the original error in the text. So that's one of the ways that they'll handle some of those discrepancies. Now at the bottom, you'll have the Masora Magna. This is the register, the main register. The Masora Magna is 
not actually printed in the BHS. We kind of have a reference table here that you can use to go look up the information that's in the Masora Magna. The Masora Magna takes the Masora Parva and expounds and expands upon it. So it, it takes it to greater lengths. So in the BHS, you'll see reference to it, but you won't see the actual information. You'd have to go look it up elsewhere in other texts. Typically, the final Masora information came at the end of main sections or at the end of books. And this was very precise information. It's data. And they provided this data to help ensure accuracy. They can help count and make sure they got all their words in uh, or letters in things of that nature now when you look at the chapters and verses it's very easy to see books it's very easy to see chapters verses are interesting because the verse ends with a sof pasuk the sof pasuk kind of looks like a colon but like with diamonds instead of dots and it simply means end of verse However, it doesn't mean end of sentence. So context will help determine when the sentence actually ends, not the sof pasuk. Additionally, Hebrew doesn't use commas. It does not use periods. It does not use semicolons. It does not use exclamation marks. It does not use question marks. Those are English features. Hebrew is not English. So you will use your context and your understanding of grammar and syntax, as well as vocabulary to help determine when you should include in your translation, a question mark, a period, a comma. You're gonna have to figure it out based on context. Now I'm not a master of the accents from the Masoretic system. I'm just not. There is a bookmark that can be helpful that comes with BHS if you buy the hard copy version. And it can help explain what these accent marks are. The accent marks can help you with flow, flow of thought, not just uh, recitation, but help mark flow of thought. The, the problem with that is that came later. So it's still subject to context. It's still subject to interpretation. Another thing to keep in mind is with the accents, there are some accents that look like things we've already learned. The Saluk accent versus the Metheg. <sighs> they look identical. They really do. I mean, I don't think I don't think I could discern a difference. So, uh, you know, you're gonna need to rely on your knowledge of the vowel pointings, the Nikud, and context. Context is key. Now, long the accents system sometimes in the bhs you're gonna see pausal forms and this is confusing but the vowels will change typically lengthen to show a pause and this this in large part does not follow any of our rules uh so for example katal is uh, comets and a pathak. Yeah, the pausal form is a double comets, but it's still cal perfect. <sighs> what can I say? I don't know. Maybe the Masoretes were drunk. I'm not sure. Just be aware that that could be a thing. Just be aware of it. Recognize it. I'm not saying you have to love it. Just saying you have to be able to recognize it. And lastly, we have the textual apparatus at the bottom of the BHS. So this is the collection of information, whether looking at the Septuagint or looking at other manuscript evidence to support or, or provide context for the selected text in the BHS. And it, it's what you would refer to, for example, when you're looking at the brackets of the textual variants. So we have autographs. These are the originals. Then you have your copied texts. We don't have any autographs. They're all lost. All we have are copied texts and they're not all identical. So there is a scientific process called textual criticism that 
seeks to determine what is the original text. And sometimes it leads to heated debate. Hence, that's why in the text of the BHS, sometimes you'll see some bracketed texts because it's hotly debated. And so you'll need to parse through it and figure out what is the text. And sometimes you'll arrive at a different conclusion as someone else, and that's fine. But you'll want to get used to looking at the textual apparatus. You'll want to learn what the textual witnesses are. How old are they? You'll want to compare what the different variants show and try to account for it and try and get to the original text. Sometimes the textual variants are unintentional. It happened because, you know, maybe there was a dyslexic scribe and they transposed words or, 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 or phrases. They didn't mean to, but it happened. Some of it could be intentional. The scribe disagreed with something, changed it, or maybe they were simply trying to clarify something intentionally. Now the BHS is not in the same listed order as our English Bibles. The BHS is what we would call the Tanakh. It starts with the Torah. Then it goes to the prophets, the Nevi'im. Then it goes to the writings, the Ketuvim. Hence the acronym Tanakh. Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. As such, uh, these, these sections do not follow the same order that we have in English. Even within the Ketuvim, Chronicles is last. Let that sink in for a moment. Also, several books are joined together as one book. So the English texts separate these books out. The Hebrew texts, they're joined together as one book. Kings is not first and second Kings. It's just Kings. Samuel, same thing. Chronicles, same thing. Ezra and Nehemiah were actually one book. Now, as far as lexicons are concerned, when it comes to interpreting BHS, which is to say the Hebrew Bible, you're going to need some good lexicons. There's a standard one that I like to use. I call it Halot, H-A-L-O-T, Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. Very exhaustive. It's a modern lexicon. Uh, you can get it for fairly cheap if you get it digital through, say, something like Accordance. I don't know if Logos has it. I assume it would. But Bible software like that can make it much more cost effective to acquire. And it takes up far less space because I think Halo is, I think it's about 15 volumes, correct me if I'm wrong. It's a lot. So it would take up a, a lot of your library space. A standard one is BDB, Brown Driver Briggs. It's a bit older, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. It's also a lot harder to use. It's a single volume lexicon, which in and of itself is not a bad thing. But the way it's organized, it's a bit harder to find contents. Now, if you get a digital version, it doesn't matter. Uh, for example, I access it through Accordance and I'm able to triple click on any word and it takes me right to where I want to be in Brown Driver Briggs. But otherwise, be aware, it's older, it's harder to navigate, but it it is a standard when it comes to Hebrew lexical information. There are other lexicons out there, but those are the two that I'm most familiar with. Those are the two that I use. I would encourage you to see what's available on the software that you use, or if you want a hardbound book, find what's available and it's cost effective for you. And just roll with that. A lexicon is better than no lexicon. You're also gonna want some grammars. While we love the red hymnal, it's an introduction, right? That's what, an inch? It's not exactly exhaustive. Sometimes we need more explanation to understand what's going on in the Hebrew text. That's where additional grammars will come in. Let me show you the two that I use. Uh, again, you can get these in digital form. 
Uh, the two that I have here are in hardbound copy. First up is Waltke O'Connor, and it's a thick big boy, all right? This one is very exhaustive, very exhaustive, very thorough. Now don't let the size fool you all too much because this one's 685 pages, okay? Compare that to Gassinius here. This is the second edition. I believe there's now a third edition, if not a fourth. So this is old uh, and I just don't feel like buying another copy, but see how thick that is? Compare. Okay, now what if I told you that this is also 500 pages? Before the index, or indices I should say, because there are many, it's 500 pages. 500 pages. So don't let the size fool you. It's quite exhaustive and dense as well. Now, Cassinius is older. This was originally written in the early 1900s. This is the second edition, 1910. 1910, it's old. Compare that with Waltke O'Connor, 1990. So use the grammars, they will help you research, they will help you clarify, they will help you dig deep and figure out what it is you're looking at in the text. They might have a paradigm for you to follow. They might explain some of the usage of different verbs, right? Mind you, I wrote a page on my blog about understanding the force of Hebrew verbs. This looks at aspect, aspect referring to uh, the conjugations. So we have the perfect, the imperfect, cohortative, imperative, jussive, infinitive, and participles. What do those conjugations mean? How are they used? But then the post also covers actions art which is all about the verbal stems. You have your cal stem, your nifal stem, your pl, your puau, your hifil, your hofal, your hithpael. What do the stems mean? That's what actions art is all about. And so I gave a quick and dirty synopsis for reference, but it's these grammars that are gonna dive deep into each of those concepts and help you clarify what is going on when you see, for example, a hithpael infinitive construct. What's going on when you see a, a nifal infinitive construct? What, what's going on when you see a hithil participle? So you're gonna need your grammars. All right, so that's it for this week. That's the BHS nitty gritty details. But next time, we're gonna dive into actual translation. We're gonna start with Ruth chapter one. By the end of this whole thing, we're gonna translate all of Ruth. It's only four chapters. We'll take one chapter, one week at a time. We're gonna focus on nouns, adjectives, and construct chains in this first week in Ruth one. In Ruth chapter two, we're gonna focus on our basic cal stem. In Ruth chapter three, we're gonna focus on our other derived stems. And then in Ruth chapter four, we're gonna focus on textual criticism and the Masora Parva. So that's what lies ahead. I look forward to working through Ruth with you. We'll see you next time.